Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're one of our friends from the West Coast. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar, Conducting the 2021 PIT in the Age of COVID-19. My name is Joy Moses. I am the Director of the Alliance's Homelessness Research Institute, and I am joined today by Dan Treglia and Rebecca Brown. Um, both are professors at the University of Pennsylvania, and they have authored a recent report um, similarly titled, Conducting an Unsheltered Point-in-Time Count During the COVID-19 Pandemic, which can currently be found um, on the Alliance's website. We'll also put a link to that report in the chat momentarily. Um, we recognize definitely that these are unprecedented times for your work. Um, depending on the circumstances of your community, unsheltered numbers may be growing as, as the recession pushes more people into poverty and social distancing concerns place constraints on indoor spaces. Thus, there remains a need to continue to track the size of the unsheltered population. However, protecting the health of people experiencing homelessness, volunteers and staff is also an overwhelming concern as many localities across the country experience spiking COVID-19 case numbers. Um, necessarily, COCs are, been, are and have been making difficult decisions about how to handle their 2021 counts. And today's session is designed to continue that discussion and provide information sharing opportunities around recent HUD guidance and um, shifts in the way that we anticipate the count will happen this year. Before we start, um, I would like to encourage you to ask questions throughout the session using um, the Q&A box on your screen. Um, I also want to um, highlight that we're going to, I guess at this point, ask a couple of brief poll questions. We wanna know um, where what, what's on your mind right now and, and the things that, that are, are being experienced in your COC. So you should see um, the first Q&A question appear on your screen. And we're gonna give you a few moments to answer that question and then we'll shift to a second session, second question and then start the session. And thank you for, for doing that. This is very helpful for us. Okay. Okay. And we're going to go through another <laughs> slight pause as we ask a second question. So um, uh, we appreciate your um, patience with the with the slight dead air at the beginning of the session. We we will actually speak during the course of the session, but we'll just do the second polling question. Okay, so as um, as a few of you wrap up um, wrap up your responses because I see them slowing down a little bit, I will um, prepare to turn the floor over to our first speaker, um, Dan Treglia. He is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, 
at a, at a very long named <laughs> center, the Partnership for Effective Public Administration and Leadership and Ethics. So um, that is with quite a mouthful to match um, all of <laughs> the work that he does. Um, and we'll, we'll look forward to hearing his presentation. So Dan. Let me unmute myself. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I know it is a, a long center name. I did not come up with it. Um, I will not take the, the heat for it uh, on this webinar. Um, so my name is Dan Chargley. I'm an associate professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania um, and was delighted to work uh, with Rebecca and Joy and Jackie and the rest of the NAH team um, on putting together a report about how to conduct an unsheltered pit estimate um, during this pandemic. And we all know that uh, pits aren't simple and easy in, in even the kind of easier of years. And certainly as COVID-19 makes the, everything much more complicated, um, that is, is at least as true for this. And the pit, as you all know, is rapidly approaching. And I know people were looking to HUD for their guidance. That guidance came out. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and now everyone is thinking about, okay, do we do a, a an unsheltered pit this year? And if so, how? Um, and one of the big questions is kind of how does that get done? Um, right? COVID-19 has, among other things, probably changed one, who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness, um, two, the services that are used by people that are experiencing homelessness um, as kind of service locations change and service use changes. And third, for people that are in fact, experiencing unsheltered homelessness, um, where are they located? Um, the other piece of background here is that HUD is offering lots and lots of flexibility in how and even if um, counts are conducted. And I'm sure you've all seen recently um, that uh, a couple of very large COCs are not conducting their unsheltered pit counts. And I know some of you said you are not conducting a, an unsheltered count this year or you're unsure of it. And I hope that this is this, this webinar and the report um, kind of helps you make uh, those decisions about whether it's something that your, um, your COC can handle. So like I said before, this is meant to supplement, um, absolutely not replace, um, HUD guidance, right? This is our hope is to kind of illuminate points that we think are important and hopefully make them a little bit more um, understandable. And we focused, and that report is available on the Alliance's uh, website. And we have recommendations focused on, on a few areas, um, increasing the use of outreach teams and reducing reliance on volunteers, um, increasing the use of technology in both training and serving, especially important as we think about reducing face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and we can't have people, you know, gathered at a trading site this year. Um, expanding our uh, time frame, um, reducing the overall burden of account through um, systematic, maybe probability-driven sampling, um, and also service-based and HMIS uh, data approaches. Okay. Also, most importantly, and this is something that Rebecca will, will spend a lot more time on, um, is conducting the count safely. And the fact that Rebecca is talking about it, not me, doesn't mean that I don't care about it. Um, um, it's just right that is clearly underlying every bit of this. It's why we're having these conversations, um, and something we need to keep in mind when we're talking about every element of this, because there is no um, there is no acceptable number of infections that results from a pit count. But the only acceptable pit count is a safe pit count. Um, and with that in mind, we know that. Um, conditions both in uh, kind of COVID cases and severity and also um, preparation for the pit count vary from place to place. So we are not imposing anything um, on you. This is meant to be um, kind of guidance and taken in cons into consideration with, uh, you know, your local agencies, your local health department, CDC guidelines. Um, and Rebecca's getting into a lot more of that um, over the, the course of, uh, of this presentation. Um, the other thing that I want to note um, is that I want you to embrace the change. Um, we can't pretend that everything um, is as it always was. Um, and so we, I feel like one of the most common expressions I heard when working in government is that we want comparisons to be apples to apples. Um, that's going to be hard this year, um, especially 
if we're making changes, and we certainly should be making changes um, to accommodate the, safe, the required safety protocols for COVID-19. So I think kind of let go of apples to apples comparisons for a year, if, if you can, um, right? Focus on an apples to lemons comparison, but that doesn't have to be bad. And yes, I know this is a cliche that builds on another cliche, um, but we can actually kind of take this as an opportunity to reevaluate some methodologies and procedures um, even beyond this anomalous year. Um, so we'll talk about statistical sampling and app-based paperless surveys as tools that could reduce um, a pit's burden and increase efficiency and produce more statistically reliable and valid estimates, um, regardless of a pandemic and could be considered for uh, future years. The other piece that I wanna add here as we get into the outline is I would like for you all to be kind of uh, writing your questions into the Q&A section as they come up. Um, don't wait till the end because A, you'll forget them and B, we're all going to get tired of hearing my voice. And so if we have your questions through Joy um, coming in through, uh, through the Q&A block, uh, that would be fantastic. So here's what we'll talk about. Uh, volunteer, um, kind of the concerns with using uh, volunteers or at least relying on them to the same extent and how we can leverage outreach teams a little bit more effectively. And as a part of that, because we have fewer outreach staff than you would normally have volunteers, how we can increase the efficiency of a pit count. Um, and spe specifically focused on a street-based count here, but we'll get to service-based and HMIS approaches later on. So for the street counts, we're talking about observation-based counts um, and abbreviated surveys, expanding the, the PIT timeframe. And those are all exceptions that HUD has made for this year and also um, expanding the use of app-based surveys. Um, okay, and then we have to make adjustments to training enumerators because we can't do that the way we usually do it. Uh, we'll talk about sampling in some depth um, then we'll move on to our other approaches, the service-based counts and using administrative data, um, HMIS, or other outreach data that's incorporated into or used by the agency, even if it is not technically an HMIS. Um, and that's going to be a little bit kind of text heavier than I would love for it to be. Um, I promised Joy a short presentation and then realized that I had lied when this was all said and done. Um, and so what we will do, go do it at the end is, is have an example um, kind of going through a pit count from soup to nuts. Okay, so talk about, let's talk about pro leveraging professional outreach teams. Um, so there will be limited opportunity to engage the public and the volunteers in the same way for this year as we would in normal years. Um, right? For one, if your community has a stay-at-home order or is in any way limiting um, kind of the ability of people to go out or perhaps as curfews or something along those lines, public engagement, bringing out volunteers might not be an option. Um, those stay-at-home orders are persisting and likely to, exp to expand as cases grow. And I think it is, I don't want to say assured, but certainly likely to go up um, as uh, after the holidays. Um, you also might have volunteers that are wary of participating. Um, many volunteers are likely to be part of high-risk populations, but regardless of that, even if your volunteers are not part of a high-risk population, um, I think one of the things that we, we've learned um, over the course of this pandemic is that everyone is susceptible um, to having severe adverse outcomes and um, even someone who doesn't could spread it to others. And so we need to be very careful of that. Um, okay. And normal volunteer-based procedures that we would normally do are unsafe this year, um, right? Normal PIT procedures often require volunteers to be trained and staged at a single or a multiple training sites with hundreds of other volunteers or share cars um, with, other with other volunteers and walk kind of maybe for a long time, you know, within a few feet of each other, within a couple of feet of each other, and then maybe get close to somebody, um, right? Those are not acceptable practices this year. Um, and there may be some workarounds, uh, some of which we'll discuss later, um, logistically and technologically, um, but some of them are going to be a little bit complicated. And because of that, um, you are likely to see a reduction in your volunteers. So even if you go ahead with a volunteer-based approach, you're likely to see a drop-off in the number of volunteers showing up, number one, and number two, um, you may have more of a drop-off from volunteer registration 
um, to kind of who shows up on that night um, than you would in most years. And the last thing you want to be doing on, on that pit night is rearranging teams and scrambling to try to make everything work. Um, right. That is, again, these things are hard in a normal year. They are obviously kind of more difficult this year. And the fewer variables that we add to the equation, um, the better off these are. Um, okay. So there are some advantages to using outreach teams here. Um, there are, uh, first, they're already scheduled and they are kind of right on staff. So you can accurately anticipate your available resources. Um, so even if it takes longer than it would if you're using volunteers, um, you know how many people you'll get each night. Um, second, outreach teams are already engaging with people that are on the streets. Um, so those interactions should be happening anyway. And these are outreach teams that are practiced or should be practiced um, at doing this safely. Um, third, outreach teams should have already should already have the necessary PPE, like masks, gloves, face shields, hand sanitizers, that you probably don't have enough for for all of your volunteers if you were going to go with a volunteer-based approach. Um, so um, there are some, I think, good reasons and compelling reasons to make to leverage up your professional outreach teams. Okay. Um, so, but as I mentioned before, you have fewer outreach staff than you would have volunteers in a normal night. So how can you improve the efficiency? Um, one is by conducting an, an observation-based count. Um, this allows for more efficient coverage because you, you can walk through areas uh, more quickly if you're not stopping to uh, engage people, um, right? I know many communities also drive through areas. Um, and again, that's something that uh, can be used as well. There are obviously some downsides um, to driving. And then if someone's, let's say, sleeping or hunkered down on the other side of a parked car, on the sidewalk side of a parked car, they could be missed uh, through a windshield survey. Um, and the other, the other benefit of an observation-based count is that this limits the interactions uh, between enumerators and uh, respondents or people that are that are homeless. Um, there are, of course, trade-offs here. And this is um, a game of, of trade-offs. Um, but one, you're making assumptions based on appearance. And we all know that assumptions can be um, misleading. Um, but again, that is just a, kind of one of the trade-offs here. Second, there is a risk of duplication. Um, this can be mitigated um, by... Um, this can be mitigated by kind of structuring your count in such a way that you're not counting kind of areas where people kind of go between on consecutive nights or on multiple nights. Um, and that you try to connect, conduct your count in as quickly a, as quick a time frame as possible. Um, also, you can't collect demographics this way. And HUD has um, HUD's guidance this year um, says that they do not want you uh, assuming or observing demographic characteristics. Um, so something to keep in mind in an area where you may want a waiver. Um, and those HUD waivers that I've mentioned before, and we will continue to mention, um, right? if you're going to omit any of the generally required data um, from your, your submission this year, you do need to reach out to HUD. Um, I believe you need to reach out to send an email to William Snow um, to, to do that. Uh, just keep that in mind, and you might want to allow for some time to do that. Okay. Um, the other, one of the other options is abbreviated surveys. So if you do conduct surveys, um, and HUD's website does have some links to um, abbreviated surveys, um, that allows you to ascertain housing status a little more precisely than, than just an observation uh, based count would do. And second, it allows you opportunities to deduplicate, either by gathering some pieces of information um, or by um, asking whether or not someone's been asked these questions before. Um, but I think the overwhelming point from us and from HUD is that's it. Do not use this, th this year's pit as the opportunity to gather as much information as you can about people. Um, we want to limit it to just kind of understanding the scope of homelessness generally. Okay, third, we can expand the time frame of the, of the count. So usually HUD allows for these counts to go on for up to seven days. Um, this year that has been extended to, expanded to 14 days. Um, that requires a lot of plan. So one, that is a, a godsend, but also it requires diligent planning to be done well. Um, make sure you're covering distinct areas, distinct geographic areas 
on each night and do so in a way that minimizes the chance that me that people move between areas covered um, on different nights, um, right? If, if you know that, you know, people don't move, let's say your COC has two different counties and you know that people don't move from county to county, right? Maybe you count one county one night and one county the next night. Or if people, or if you have urban and rural areas, you know, people tend to stay in the same place from night to night. You focus one night on the urban areas, one night on the rural areas, because you don't expect to get any overlap between those two. Um, you'll also want to plan for contingencies because let's face it, pit count generally um, are just kind of baskets of contingencies. You never know which ones are going to show up, but you know that some will. And your job is to be kind of um, agile and, and ready. And that's even more true this year. And even if you're scaling things back, things will creep up um, that you did not expect. So you might want to allocate additional nights, um, have additional staff on hand. So if you have you know five outreach teams available, maybe you're only deploying four because you know that something could come up with, with one of those teams. And so the fifth one could step in. And, and there are others. And that could be something that we talked about. And if you could enter your ideas into the Q&A for other contingencies that you've anticipated, that could help the other communities that are listening right now. Um, also, deduplication is a little bit harder. And again, we need to be very diligent in trying to ask about, you know, has someone been asked these questions before and limiting the kind of geographic overlap that, that could occur. Um, HUD is also allowing larger pits to have multiple pit nights. So usually you're asking, you know, if January 23rd is your pit night, you'd be asking people about where they slept on the night of January 23rd. But for community uh, communities um, where we expect that that are large enough where we do not expect kind of uh, kind of mobility from one place to another, each of those different areas, the geographic regions, could have multiple could could have their own pit night. Not each area does not get multiple pit nights, but each area could have a different pit night. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, mobile app surveys, and I have been a fan of these for a while. Here are examples of just a, a couple of them. Um, so for one, especially this year, they eliminate the need or minimize the need for physical exchanges of paper, which means that you may not need people to even come to a kind of staging site, um, which is incredibly important this year when we cannot have large gatherings. Um, um, it also makes your logistics a lot easier as well. Uh, I think there are benefits that go beyond just the pandemic though. It reduces the time, the cost of printing, sorting, distributing, uh, checking paper surveys. Um, I remember working and, and kind of getting, you know, thousands of surveys back and having to sort through um, all of them. And if you've ever done this, I know it's the bane of your existence as it was uh, mine. And so this minimizes a lot of the, the errors uh, that come from a paper-based survey. Um, they often come with other benefits, including kind of geolocations. You can actually track where someone was counted um, or just mapping so your, your volunteers or outreach teams know where to go. Um, you can, they can introduce flexibility in uh, questions, um, things like that, uh, maybe other languages. Um, there are some, we've listed a few vendors here. This is by no means either a complete list um, or a comprehensive list of important features of some of these tools, um, but it's what, what we could, could find and, um, and we wanted to get this out to you as quickly as possible. So do your due diligence. Um, but perhaps this grid can be a starting point for you. And this grid is also available in the report that we've put together. Okay. Other things that are important. For one, training needs to change. Um, you cannot have 300 people from multiple households gathered in a single room. Please don't. Um, right? That just is not an option this year. And I would argue that's another reason for if you have the ability, um, rely on outreach teams rather than uh, volunteers. Um, cause, and in some places, they're probably not going to be legal right now. Um, so virtual trainings are possible and you should look into web conferencing options um, and you should think about those uh, now um, while you still have some time to test drive a, a couple and there are quite a few available. We're doing this over Zoom. There's you know WebEx, there's BlueJeans. Uh, we have a, a similar grid um, in the report, which you should check out. And again, that's not a comprehensive list, uh, but you should also be aware of the constraints, um, like how many volunteers or how many people 
um, can attend any of these web conferencing things. And you know, how can you reinforce the material? Um, because I hope you haven't kind of zoned out yet, but certainly if you're going through an hour long training, uh, volunteers might, 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 their eyes might glaze over if, if you can see them. It's thinking about how you can reinforce the material through breakout rooms, quizzes, chats, role-playing, things like that. And so you need to build that in to your requirements um, for any of these tools. Um, okay, moving along. And I know that I'm speaking quickly because I want to make sure that we get to your questions and that we uh, have ample time for Rebecca's piece as well on the now, the obvious health and health and safety uh, concerns. Um, the other piece that I think is important to consider, not just for this year, but for future years, um, is how uh, we can conduct and, and increase our use of statistically meaningful uh, samples. Um, the, you know, these samples allow you to visit a selection of geographies, you know, from within your total COC and make inferences from that sample to your entire continuum of care, okay? Generally speaking, there has to be some element of probability in there. You know, you have a thousand, let's say, census tracts in your area, you know, in your continuum of care, and you then um, say, all right, I'm gonna go to, you know, 30, th or not 30, maybe 100 of them, so 10% of them. Um, you then know, right, how to extrapolate to the other 900 areas, you also have some idea of your uncertainty. You have that margin of error that allows you to estimate this and it allows you to make apples to apples comparisons from year to year. Um, I think one of the concerns that I tend to have about many approaches is that you're going to different hotspots every year. And I think that's good, but right, hotspots can means that you, you may miss places where you don't know people already are, and in some ways they can be a little bit self-fulfilling. Um, but also if you're going to different hotspots each year, it makes it hard to compare year to year. So these probability-driven samples allow for those apples to apples comparisons and also allows for you to know your margin of error. So, you know, then, then maybe your, your pit number goes up by 30 or 50. Well, is that just a matter of chance or is that a real change? Well, we can look at our statistics, our margin of error um, to, to know and to tell you. Um, but despite despite the you know probability and statistical mumbo jumbo coming out of me right now, these are not kind of difficult. They are not hard to implement. They just require a little bit more planning on, on the front end, but I would argue they make the work a hundred times easier on the night of the count and on and on the back end. And also, if you're looking for ways to increase your efficiency by limiting the number of places you need to go to, um, it is a good systematic way to do that, um, not an ad hoc, uh, not an ad hoc solution. Okay. Moving on. So, how would you do that? So, you would take your continuum of care and you divide that into smaller regions. I think the HUD guidance refers to these as census areas, to, as sub areas. And to the extent that you can leverage existing boundaries like census tracts or block groups um, or you know, community, community districts or whatever it is, um, those are good for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it takes, out, it takes away some level of arbitrariness. Um, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel and it saves time. And also, if you want to understand kind of the demographic or geographic correlates of where you should expect to find people, you could even build predictive models over where should we expect to see people. You can do that because you can get, you know, some of those characteristics from the census data. And again, those are pretty easy to do. Um, you just have to make sure things line up. Again, not hard to do. You also need to choose an approach. And there are a couple of general ways to do this. One is a simple random sample. It's the one that we're probably most common with. With, you know, you have a thousand, let's say, census tracts in your continuum of care. You're going to pull a hundred of them. It's easy, but it's less precise. And, and that's most appropriate when, let's say, every one of those thousand areas has about the same number of homeless people in it or the same probability of finding homeless people in it. That's, you know, that's not terribly common um, because homelessness is not evenly distributed across a community. So uh, what most communities would probably opt to do, and what I see most communities opting to do, is what's called a stratified sample. We categorize those sub-areas based on levels of homelessness within each of the sub-areas. Now, you can get as granular as you want on those. Um, you need to have what it might be called kind of so, uh, certainty areas, which are areas that you absolutely have to go to because they don't represent 
um, any other part of your, your continuum and no other area can represent them. So if you are Philadelphia, for example, and right, which is near where I live, you know, 30, so we have Suburban Station, we have 30th Street Station. Those are major transit hubs where we know uh, people that are experiencing homelessness congregate. And so those would kind of stand on their own. But then you might could also have, let's say, high density areas where you expect to find one or more people and low density areas where you don't expect to, to have people. Um, and then maybe you can take random samples of those and then you extrapolate just to the other high density areas or just to the other low density areas. And then you add that up again, we'll go through that um, in our example. And then you determine your sample sizes. You go to as many high density areas as you can, but you know, this is more art than science um, because you wanna, right? The more areas you go to, the more precise your estimate. Um, but you're also sampling because you are constrained in some way you know, for how many areas that you can go to. That could be by volunteers, it could be by other logistical constraints. You want to at least go to, I would argue, 30 of these sub areas. That number is certainly negotiable, but you want to go to enough areas that a single kind of odd area won't throw off your entire estimate. That, you know, if you go to, if you go to 15 areas, having, with, if one of those areas has a lot of people, that would really throw off your estimate. But if you go to 50, you know, that one aberrant area um, is gonna have much less of an impact and that's important. And so again, you're just trying to strike that balance. Um, and then you calculate your results. Um, and so you create a weighting factor based on just how many areas do you go to as a total, you know, versus how many areas are in that category. So let's say we had, we have a total of 60 low density areas and we, we sample 20 of them. So our weighting factor is just 60 divided by 20. So our weighting factor is three. And now let's pretend after the count that we found 15 people in those low density areas. Well, 15 times our weighting factor of three is 45. Fantastic. There's our low density total estimate. And you would then add that to your high density estimate, your certainty estimate, things like that. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on to a couple of other methods though. And so service-based counts. Um, where you're not sending people out into the streets and parks and, and transit areas, uh, but you're serving people that are coming in for social services. Um, you know, uh, you know, soup kitchens, um, social service offices, things like that. Um, these do require surveying. Um, you can't do this as an observation. Um, I think there are times that these are generally preferable, um, especially in rural settings where street count is likely to be inefficient. Uh, we have very, very few people um, you know, in, in a very large space. Um, they're also especially useful in counting or, or estimating the, the, the scope of hard to count populations. I know they're especially uh, important for um, our youth counts. Um, deduplication is especially important when you're doing this um, because someone can use the same service site over, over multiple days. Um, and these counts especially tend to take place over a seven or, you know, few day period. Uh, but people can also go to multiple service centers if this is being conducted um, you know, at, at more than one place as it most likely is. Um, now, generally things are easier if these are not combined with street-based counts, but they can be. I believe in uh, Louisiana a few years ago, um, the street-based counts were conducted in urban areas or parts of, or in, part, in part of Louis, Louisiana, maybe the balance of state. Um, street-based counts were conducted in um, urban areas and a service-based count was conducted in rural areas. Um, that is an acceptable way to do it. It becomes a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's certainly not impossible and not technically hard. You just have to be very intentional, very intentional about how you do this. Um, the other is using HMIS or other administrative data um, to construct your PIT estimate. Um, so COCs can submit that this year and that's explicit, made explicit by the HUD guidance. Um, but I think the requirement from uh, William and her generally is you have to demonstrate that this that these data are some are a reliable estimate of how many people are on your streets um, or in, in or living in unsheltered situations. Um, so before you write that that email to William, just think about how can you show that this can be counted on um, as as for your pit estimate. All right, let's take a let's, let's go through an example. Okay, I've chosen Springfield, USA. 
Um, I don't know why, but this is um, right. Let's say a medium sized community that has, that is geographically uh, heterogeneous. You have a downtown, you know, kind of a, your, your city outskirts, your city fringe, and then you have your suburbs. Okay. You've decided that you probably want to do a sample of some kind. So the first thing that you need to do is divide your geography, your total geography into systematic sub areas and have each one of them labeled. So you've discovered that you have 200 census tracts in your community. And so you have, so you, so you label each of these one to 200 and those are going to be your, your pit area, your pit sub areas. Um, you have 50 in your downtown. You can see that those are one to 50. You have 60 in your city fringe. Those are numbered from 51 to 110. And then you have um, 90 in your suburbs. Okay. You've decided after talking to your, your outreach teams. So the question is, how do you come up with which sampling approach do you want to do, right? How do you know how, how kind of dispersed your homeless population is? Um, because if it's evenly dispersed, sure, you do a simple random sample. Um, but if not, you're going to want to stratify it. And you do that by talking to your outreach teams um, through your own institutional knowledge. Again, as systematic as you can make that, um, the better. I think there are some tools out there that collect that. And especially if you have HMIS data or other administrative data that can know where people are, you're going to want to, you're going to want to use that, leverage that for sure. Um, this community has decided they want to do a stratified sample um, and they've stratified their their geography into three different kinds of, of zones. You have your certainty zones, your level one. We have two of them in red. Maybe those are areas where they expect to find a lot of people. Then we have our level two. We're calling those high density zones, areas where we would expect to find, you know, one or more people. And then in th level three is our low density areas. Those are in blue. We have a hundred of those. And you can see those are, are predominantly in the suburbs. Okay. So your next step is to create and then pull your sample. So you're going to go to all of your certainty zones, right? Those are certainty after all. Um, and then you're going to take random samples of your high density and low density zones. So we're going to go to 30 of our 98 low density zones and 32 of our 100, or, sorry, 30 of our 98 high density zones and then 32 of our 100 low density zones. Okay. And then what you need to do, and I mentioned this earlier, is you need to think about kind of which areas are you going to send to which teams and which areas will be covered on which night. And you want to be systematic about this and intentional about it. So everyone knows their assignments. Um, so let's say that January 23rd is your pit night. Um, and really, you should be conducting not an observation-based count over four nights. Um, you should be right, if you're doing it over multiple nights. Um, you should be conducting surveying over multiple nights. I wish I'd change this in advance. Um, but right to make sure that you're not duplicating across nights and across geographies. Um, and let's say that you have, right, so four nights to do this and four outreach teams, and you're grouping similar areas together. And I don't have a slide kind of lining this up, but if you look in the report, you can see that what we did is we tried to put urban areas together and, and rural areas together. So to minimize the amount of geographic overlap and reduce the probability um, that we have a duplicated count. Okay, and then how do we compile results? Okay, so let's pretend that these are our counts. We found 41 people in our certainty areas, 17 people in our high density areas, and two people in our low density areas. Okay, well, we're gonna wanna do some extrapolations here. Okay, well, luckily we have, uh, you know, we're doing one for one for our certainty areas, right? There's no extrapolation there because we're going to all of them. So those 41 people just count for 41 people. For our high density areas though, well, we went to 30 of our 98. So that gives us a weighting factor of 3.3. So you multiply our 17 by our 3.3. And that tells us that we should, that we have 56 people in all of our high density areas, right? Again, that goes from our sample of 17 to our total of 56.1. And then for low density areas, we had two there. Again, we didn't have many because we don't expect to have many people in low density areas. But lo and behold, we had people where we didn't expect to have people. And that's not terribly uncommon. So our weighting factor there is 100 divided by 32. Um, so it's 3.125. 3 
Um, and we only had a full estimate of six and a quarter people in our low density areas. So our pit total, right, the number that you're submitting to HUD for your unsheltered count is just the sum of those. It's our 41 plus our 56.1 plus our 6.25, um, and that rounds to 103. Um, and, and that's the mechanics of it. So I think this is not terribly complicated. Um, it just requires a little bit uh, more work on, on the front end to make sure you're doing it systematically. Um, okay. so, oh, I'm uh, sorry. I just wanted to um, to make sure that um, we, we moved along uh, at a at a soon point. Yeah. So with that, I would, sorry, I, I've, I've spoken for way too long at this point. Um, but I will, uh, you, my email address is here um, and go check out the report. Feel free to contact us. And I know we've got some questions. Yeah. And I, I think we probably should go ahead and have Rebecca um, speak about some of the health concerns before we move into the questions. I, I, I know she has some important information to share as well. So I don't want us to miss that. Definitely. Um, Rebecca. Hi, thanks, Joy. Uh, so my presentation is relatively short, so we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but thanks, Dan, for that great information. Uh, my name is Rebecca Brown. I am a physician. I'm trained in internal medicine and geriatric medicine. Um, I'm at Penn and at the Philadelphia VA. This guidance um, on maintaining health and safety during the 2021 PIC count is grounded in the, the HUD guidelines, so this should be quite familiar to folks on the call. So a quick overview, um, we'll go through four main points. First, um, consistent with the HUG guidance, we recommend that if feasible, you partner with your local health authority or healthcare for the homeless organization, if that's possible for you, just to get guidance that's uh, appropriate to your local context. We'll go into a little more detail in the next slide about this. Second, our big recommendation is you use appropriate PPE. Third, you maintain social distancing. And fourth, you incorporate some screening and testing and or testing for COVID-19. And, you know, all these guidelines are going to be familiar to folks because of the last, we've all been going through this over the past 10 months of the pandemic. So first, as Ollie already noted, uh, we do recommend that if you can get some local partnership or guidance, that can be helpful just to make sure that you develop plans that are going to be appropriate for what's going on in your local community in terms of transmission, levels of transmission, um, and the PPE that you have available. Second, we recommend that you use consistent, that you use appropriate PPE. And consistent with the HUG guidance, that means um, we recommend that you supply N95 masks, if those are available, to enumerators in areas with moderate to high COVID transmission. And of course, we know that unfortunately right now in the country, transmission levels are, are very high in um, in many communities. And for that reason, we recommend that in addition to those N95 masks, you consider supplying face shield gloves and hand sanitizer. And these additional items, you know, particularly the hand sanitizer, if you're using, um, if you're not handing items back and forth between enumerators, that may be less relevant to be using throughout the count, but just to have it available for before the count and at the end. In addition, we recommend that you consider, if this is feasible for you, supplying masks to homeless individuals who are encountered during the count. The third big recommendation is to maintain social distancing. You guys are pros at this. This means at least six feet from each other and from individuals whom you encounter who are experiencing homelessness. And um, again, this may not be appropriate for everyone's local conditions and uh, resources, but if you can, we recommend creating small counting teams to facilitate social distancing. The last main point is to incorporate COVID testing and screening into your procedures. Again, our recommendations here are consistent with the HUD guidance. So we recommend testing enumerators for COVID-19 no more than seven days before the count and or completing a symptom screen and temperature check before the count. Obviously, folks should stay home if they have symptoms, common sense. Um, and then monitor for symptoms 10 to 14 days following the count. So the new CDC recommendations are, would be 10 days. And then last, um, consider having your enumerators download a contact tracing application for your local um, jurisdiction. So for example, in Philadelphia, we have the COVID alert, which actually um, alerts you if you're within six feet 
for more than 15 minutes of someone who subsequently co uh, tests positive for COVID. It does not collect any identifiable information and, and other jurisdictions have similar um, apps you can install on your phone. So that's pretty much it. And hopefully that leaves us some time for questions and comments. I've seen a bunch coming in. Yes, I'm going to start going through some of the questions. Thank you, Rebecca and Dan, for your, um, your helpful presentations. I'm going to start with a question from Kelsey. Um, she says, she, or I think it's a she, um, our, our, our outreach teams are pretty stressed already and have expressed concern about doing counts during their normal work time. Any suggestions about how to help with this issue and address their concerns? Uh, I think that is not a terribly uncommon uh, concern right now. And so, I mean, I, I think HUD is, is offering a few ways of, of doing that. And so I think while certainly there are benefits of getting the data, I think kind of whether or not to conduct a count is something that you need to, to consider. Do you have the capacity to do it, right? In many ways, I hope the answer is yes, but that may not be the case. Um, and... I mean, I think you can take advantage of some of the strategies that we outlined to reduce uh, the burden on, on, on those workers, right? So, you know, they could just kind of write an observational count. So they're not talking to people. Um, and if there are ways that that kind of count could be integrated into their kind of maybe normal uh, kind of outreach work, um, that could be a way of, of, minim of minimizing that. Again, also doing it over multiple days could be a way where the burden becomes much less on, on any given night. Um, perhaps your agency also has kind of professional staff that you can leverage. So maybe they're not part of the outreach team, but they're professionals of this. And so perhaps um, you can leverage some other internal resources um, that don't require the, the mass mobilization of volunteers um, to supplement uh, the outreach team's needs. And this seems like a, a pretty important question. Um, th first, the person um, wants to thank you for your time, but they also want to know that if they don't perform the count this year, will they be eligible for federal funds? That is not my department. Oh. Well, <laughs> I will say um, <laughs> that if you need um, some sort of waiver um, for doing the normal pick count, you do need to contact HUD uh, and, and talk to, to William Snow there. Um, I put a link in the chat to the HUD guidance and his contact information is there. So you definitely want to talk to them. But, um, you know, once you get those waivers, of course, you're not, you're not going to be penalized by having your funds taken away. So um, there is a recognition that this is an unusual year. Um, but you, you do so in other words, no, you will not lose your HUD funding, but you do need to talk to them <laughs> um, before, you, before you pull the trigger and don't just don't do a count or, or modify your count, I should say, as well. Joy, I also wanted to say there's a helpful comment from Aubrey, Aubrey Sittler in the chat that says, HUD has said they can't make statements about future competitions. They're legally prohibited from doing so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, the, but they are taking, they are talking to people about waivers. So definitely like the bottom line is talk to them. <laughs> um, yeah. And when and in doubt, reach out to them. Yes. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of other questions. Uh, let me pull one up. Sorry about that. Um, there was someone who mentioned that they had developed an alternative for the mobile app, and they said they were thinking about just putting the HUD survey, one of the HUD short surveys on SurveyMonkey, which is a free, um, which is a free uh, software option. And is there any reason not to use that approach? Uh, there, there's no, there's no reason not to, it's, I, I will, I would argue that SurveyMonkey is not as good as some of the kind of other paid services, but it's certainly in a, in a pinch, SurveyMonkey do, does the job, right? It's not going to come with, um, you know, the geolocation and some other, some integration, um, that would come with, with using, you know, a, a product that's custom, that's custom made for this, but absolutely there's no reason you can't 
just use uh, SurveyMonkey or essentially put your, your paper survey on, or your abbreviated paper survey or your observation sheet um, onto SurveyMonkey to get it done that way. And we have a couple of people who um, are interested in any further insights that you could offer for people who um, are in rural geographies um, that might have um, uh, like diverse, uh, diverse uh, localities within a bigger, larger balance of state CLC. Um, I know Dan, you had mentioned some sort of mixture of observation and um, other approaches, but is, do you have any other advice? Uh, I, I don't have a, a lot of other advice. I, I do think that, um, right, I mean, you, you can use any, any approach there. Um, the difficulty in, in a rural area is not just the, the kind of geographic inefficiency, because if you can get volunteers or outreach teams out to those areas, great. Um, and so you could do a sample there. Again, you may not have enough outreach teams in an area that's, you know, 75 miles away from a, a major city. Um, so that could be a concern and that could be a, a constraint with it with a street based count. Um, and again, I like to use um, um, uh, you know random random samples or some version of random samples. Um, and so I tend to prefer those over, you know, just go to the urban areas because I, I think you you're likely to be missing, you know, at least some people in rural areas. I can't tell you where they are, but I tell you, I, I bet there are some people there that you may not know about in, in advance. Um, right. I do know that a lot of rural communities use the service-based approaches because rather than sending people to very large areas to find very few people, right, you, can, you let people come to you. There are concerns about that because you're missing people that don't come for services. Um, but you also might find people, but you also would count people that you might miss or would or would miss if they are kind of someplace that is not visible to outreach teams or, or volunteers. Um, right. So generally kind of one or the other is preferable. If I mean you can do both, and some communities have used both. You know, you do a, a street-based count in your urban area a service-based count in, in your rural area. You just want to be very intentional to make sure you're not capturing people in, in both places. You know, ask, where did you sleep that night? You were unsheltered. Okay, where were you? Because you don't want to, you know, if someone was counted in the urban uh, street count and then they go to a, a rural um, kind of social service provider, you don't want them captured in, in both places. You want to ask about where they were on, on their pet night for sure. And again, like none of this is technically complex. It just requires being intentional about every step. So um, I'll go to another question. So it seems, it does seem like um, a good suggestion to, to partner with um, healthcare providers or, or medical professionals in your community. Rebecca, can you offer some other, uh, any other advice about how to set up these relationships and how to make them work? Definitely. So, um, so for some places, obviously, in your more urban area, you may be close to a healthcare for the homeless organization. So you could certainly reach out to them if that is uh, relevant to your area. Um, if the, you don't have that resource, I would say another possibility, and again, unfortunately, this is scarce just because of the way our public health system is funded. But if you are fortunate to have a um, a department of public health in your community, you can look that up and you can reach out to them and kind of partner with them and, and make sure your guidelines are congruent with HUD. Um, beyond that, and this may be particular to your organization, but some folks may have physicians or nurse practitioners who volunteer with their organizations who would also be a source of advice. Um, so I would say those are kind of the three, HUD specifically covers the first two, you know, they recommend partnering with your local health authority or with um, healthcare, for the, healthcare for the homeless centers. Um, but I think that if you have a, a physician or someone who's actually affiliated with your organization, that would be another option. So I think um, we have another question here for Dan. So basically, um, I think it relates to the, uh, the sampling, uh, the sampling example that you went through, 
Um, and it's kind of like an overarching question related to that, because um, you basically came up with an estimate for the number of unsheltered people in the community. Um, how confident can we be in, in those estimates? And I, I, I guess I would add, um, I guess to a certain extent, we might not have many choices this year, but, um, but the person is, <laughs> is interested in just the general, because obviously that's not the same as a full count. Um, Sure. How should, we, should we feel confident in that? How should we think of this year's results with that approach? Got it. So I, I would argue that you should feel more confident in a random sample approach than you should with any other kind of sample approach, right? A, a hotspots approach, it's an approach. It's not a, it's not, it is not a comprehensive approach that allows you to estimate how many people are in your total community. Um, so there, there's absolutely a value to that. But a, you know the sampling strategies that I described allow you to make generalizations to the entirety of your um, community and to get to answer your, your question specifically, allow you to understand and estimate like just how much you may be off. It allows you to build essentially a margin of error. Um, so in most years, you wouldn't know by how much you might be off, right? You'd have no way of calculating it um, with, a, with something that uses some level of randomness. Uh, we can you know, actually calculate, you know, we think, you know, we're pretty sure that it's somewhere in this range, you know, and just like you'd see with uh, polling, um, you know, if you're, you know, following Politico or whatever it is, you have your margin of error, of, you know, plus or minus three points. Well, it's going to be your, your plus or minus, you know, 30 people. Um, but it allows you to um, kind of stake that um, and then do the same thing from year to year. I, I hope that helps, you know, feel free to my email address is there. Feel free to reach out if, if that's unclear. I'm going to mention a couple of uh, comments I see here from some of our our audience members, and maybe the uh, panelists have some thoughts on it um, with, with some of their suggestions. So one of them is really quick. Um, Freeman suggests using Google Forms as well. He says his COC used that um, uh, last year. And Rachel from, from Canada has indicated um, that, uh, that they are suggesting they're a midpoint between using volunteers and only existing outreach teams. Um, and that would be to use quote unquote volunteers from within the homeless sector. Um, this way these folks can form smaller survey teams um, since they have experience with the population and also have familiarity with COVID safety measures. Um, I just thought I'd mention those and I don't know if the panelists want to say more about those, those ideas. Unfortunately, my audio broke up for a, a little bit. I mean, if for the Google Forms, it, it sounds like, right, that's kind of the same as, as the Survey Monkey, right? It, it's totally a viable path. Um, what was the other one? I'm, I'm sorry, my audio broke up a little bit. Basically, um, instead of using regular volunteers, use volunteers that work for the homeless services system in other capacities um, because they know the population and um, can also, uh, I guess, be relied upon in these times to, to do this work. And what do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think to the extent that you have, um, that you can leverage teams right uh people that that work for that work in this system that know the population that you can rely on so there's much less uncertainty about will people show up on on their designated night um that's important people that will already have ppe that you've provided and, and enough of it and appropriate ppe um those things are all terribly important um so yes i think having <laughs> having people that you can volunteer to, sh to, sh to show up um, is oftentimes better, especially in this instance, than, than, than volunteers um, who may not be there, who may not show up on the night, may not be able to show up on the night, um, and also, you know, may not, may not be able to conduct an observational account quite as well, too. Great. So um, I'm, I'm going to close the session at this point because we are at the hour. Um, I want to definitely thank our great panelists, um, Dan, Treglia, and Rebecca Brown, not only for um, pulling together this webinar and working with us on that, but um, putting together the um, report that we have mentioned a couple times during the session. Again, um, in the few moments we have left, you can um, 
uh, find the link in the chat. Um, also, you can find the link just on the main page of our website um, in homelessness.org. So I, I would encourage you to review those materials. Um, I also would like to thank all the folks who attended today's session um, and, and asked some great questions and engaged with us, participated in our survey. We always appreciate your participation and learn so much from you while we're doing this work and, and organizing webinars and training. So um, we appreciate your participation. Have a good afternoon. I think it's afternoon for everyone. <laughs> Have a good afternoon and we look forward to seeing you at future events.